Okay, um, I was waiting a few more minutes because if uh, no one has noticed, it's still winter time around here. <laughs> so um, it never ends. In any event, what I would like to do is thank you all for being here tonight. I know that I've been called by a few people who have problems with the weather and getting here, so they may arrive somewhat late. But nevertheless, we will, we will begin. Um, most of you know I am the Dean of the School of Architecture and Design at the New York Institute of Technology. Um, and I would like to welcome all of you. And uh, thank you for coming out in this weather or being used to the weather. Um, before, and remember that the school buildings close at 8 o'clock. So it's lucky we're not in a school building for the lecture, actually. Um, in any event, I would like to remind everyone to please turn off their cell phones, which I will do in a moment myself. Um, and those of you who are registered architects and AIA members, I don't know if you already have, or you should sign up downstairs. Um, put your name down so that you get your continuing education credit, uh, which gets sent up by my events coordinator, uh, Jennifer Mitchell, to, to Albany. Um, tonight's event, lecture, is the second event of our spring lecture series. In conjunction with this lecture, we first of all welcome uh, Matt Gonin, managed to get here from Paris, uh, whereas many flights are canceled and delayed. Um, but as some of you may know, and from the invitation, um, the lecture is also complemented by an incredibly beautiful exhibition of his sketches and drawings, uh, colored pastels and black and white drawings in the 16 West 61st Street Gallery. Um, and the show looks stunning. Uh, and on Thursday night, from 5 to 7, there will be an opening in our school gallery on 16 West 61st. So please pass the word around to your classmates and those of you who have, those you know who couldn't make it tonight. That would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, the third lecture is actually a forum um, by Robert Dodris, uh, the son of actually Ali Dodris, who founded our School of Architecture many, many years ago. And it's called a sort of Main Street Forum. And the forum begins early in the morning and starts at 9 AM, and it ends at 7 PM. Uh, I'm not quite sure the logistics of it, but it's in 16 West 61st Street, so you might want to um, check that out. Our final lecture this semester is sponsored by the Friends of the School of Architecture and Design, which is this wonderful organization of people like you that have become alumni and very successful um, in the profession. And they started an organization and group. And they help us to, for instance, send students when we send our students abroad on summer programs, et cetera. And, and uh, they've been really wonderful helping us help students finance projects. And so someday when you're as successful, you'll remember us, and uh, you'll become part of the alumni friends, and you will make donations so you can help other people who will be in your place. Um, that lecture will be held in Old Westbury in the D. Siversky Center. And the architect is by, the, excuse me, the architect is Francis Halsben, uh, architect of, of note, and uh, practices in New York City. Uh, I would also like to mention that in our center gallery, and I couldn't, I, there was something about the snowstorm that made things impossible. Um, I will we'll hand this out in the Manhattan campus. There's an exhibition called The Comparative Analysis of Jean-Paul Letalouis' Edifices of Modern Rome, which, was which is from the 1800s. And he went and documented all of the great monuments in Rome. And the exhibition is a comparison where um, Professor Kevin Hinders of the University of Illinois Champaign photographed the buildings that exist in the same location that Letalwi etched them. He didn't draw them by pencil. He etched them on plate, metal plates. Um, and it is a stunning show, and it's really magnificent to see all these wonderful palaces, churches, and temples both then uh, and now, and what's really exciting is there is a volume. It's a five-volume five um, book. It's been reproduced, produced smaller, but the books are giant elephant folios, and one of the volumes is on display in the gallery. So those of you who can make it out there, um, we would love you to see the show. So 
on the on that note, I would rather than introduce Amet, who I have heard about for a long time from Professor Brian Brace Taylor. Uh, this is my first time of actually meeting Amet, and I am very glad that he was able to come and share both his thoughts with us uh, and, in fact, his exhibition. And on that note, I would have Professor Brian Taylor uh, make the introduction because they have worked closely and know each other as both colleagues and good friends. Thank you. Thanks. Don't sit on that water. Hmm? Hey, you Maybe that was for a minute. Um, I don't know, maybe I wasn't concentrating, but um, I'll make up for it if you forgot. And start out with the thank yous. Um, I want to thank, uh, <laughs> Judy is very uh, faithful in doing that in the past, but um, I want to thank uh, Jennifer Mitchell, um, who is the events organizer, and not only uh, events like this, but the, uh, the exhibitions that go on in the gallery. And uh, she has been a, a real force in uh, bringing things together in time, including a catalog which we've catalog which we have produced, but there's nobody in the back anymore. They're all up in the front, and um, and so I like to thank her, um, and uh, of course my colleague David Diamond, whose idea it was originally to uh, try and um, uh, bring over the some of our counterparts of programs, summer programs that we have in different countries. Um, we uh, did a program in France, three years running, and Ahmed Gulganen kindly participated in uh, uh, taking us to see some of his work, uh, as well as being a member of the jury. And I'm happy to see so many of the, the uh, former participants in those summer programs here tonight and the majority of you are students. Now, I have to admit that some of what you'll see tonight, I showed to a, a few of my thesis students uh, in Old Westbury and here in Manhattan uh, a week ago, sort of trying to prime the pump a little bit for tonight. Um, but uh, it's much better that you hear about um, them from Ahmed himself. And I should, should have first and foremost uh, thanked the dean. Um, for uh, inviting Ahmet to uh, come over. Uh, she has invited a number of French architects uh, in the last five years. Uh, Odile Deck was here. Ricardo Porro, who died um, two months ago on Christmas Day, was here as a guest uh, professor teaching um, and gave a number of lectures uh, as well. And um, so I thank you for that kind of uh, support. Now, much of what I was going to say, I realized that um, is on the sheet of paper that you had when you uh, uh, arrived. So I'll just briefly mention that uh, it's somewhat appropriate. Most of the people here in this room, or many of them, uh, come from very diverse backgrounds, uh, ethnically, religiously, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, Ahmet is is really a person of uh, that same genre. Uh, his father was born in uh, Macedonia in the time of the Ottoman Empire. His mother was born in Crete. In fact, his grandfather, his maternal grandfather, was an architect in Cairo uh, until the end of the, uh, the Ottoman Empire. So his origins are as diverse as, as many of you, yours. Uh, he himself was born in, uh, in Ankara and grew up in both Istanbul and uh, in Ankara. He um, was one of the very first classes at METU, Middle Eastern Technical Institute, uh, University, excuse me, um, which was founded after the Second World War, uh, in large part with American money. Uh, courses were taught in English, and um, he had professors uh, from the US, from uh, Denmark, including uh, Steen Eiler Rasmussen, who's written a number of books, one about London called The Unique City, uh, and a number of others, who came and lectured 
And uh, another was Spackelsen, the Danish architect who did the arch, the defense uh, in Paris. Um, and um, it was Spackelsen who introduced, in fact, uh, Ahmet to Louis Kahn's work. So when he um, got a scholarship to go and study, having finished his uh, first studies at the METU, um, it was a, almost a foregone conclusion that he would go to Philadelphia and enter the master's program uh, there. Having uh, taken both Kahn's master's uh, studio, he also got a master's in urban design, so two degrees uh, at Penn. And then he worked for Louis Kahn in the office for about a year before he went back to Turkey. Um, he uh, practiced in Turkey and taught until he decided to emigrate uh, gradually uh, to Paris, uh, finally in 1972. Um, he began teaching at, uh, when there was a reorganization of the Beaux-Arts, he began teaching at um, what's today called Paris Belleville School, but it was um, one of the breakaway schools run by uh, former students of uh, Louis Kahn. And um, he, uh, their first school was, in fact, in the old halls, those cast iron market buildings that were demolished in Paris in the early 1970s. The school had squatted in those buildings. So it's somewhat appropriate that tonight you'll see uh, several market places that uh, Ahmet's designed recently. Um, the halls no longer exist, but he's bringing back uh, public markets, as it were. Um, I'll um, cut short my introduction, but I just wanted to alert you to the fact that contrary to uh, the sort of architects of the star um, circuit, Ahmet is very low-key in, uh, in, uh, in his approach, in his teaching. Um, it's almost uh, um, an attitude of poetic understatement. And yet, if you look at the details, there's a tremendous uh, um, sensitivity in everything that he um, has designed in the course of uh, many years, whether it's large-scale mega projects, which he's uh, dealt with, to some of the very smaller, much smaller schools, um, synagogues, mosques, and uh, marketplaces. Uh, just to give you some, uh, some examples, but I think you'll see that um, there's a kind of moral and ethical conviction that runs through all of these works because most of his work has been for public clients, very few private clients. It doesn't work for developers, for, and uh, it's been uh, uh, really these projects such as housing, which he has done probably around 500 units in Paris uh, alone, but he did some nearly 3,000 units for a uh, new town that he designed in Turkey that was built that included marketplaces and other institutions. Uh, that's a subject for another lecture. But just to tell you that it's been a commitment on a social level that has been the driving force of his collaboration. And it's um, really too bad that his wife couldn't uh, be here tonight because they formed a partnership over nearly 40 years. Um, and so the work that you'll see has really been a, a, a deeply collaborative one. So, Amit, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, I thank Dean DiMaio to Brian for their introduction. I am honored to be here in this rather exceptional environment, also in an exceptional day climatically. <laughs> and, and things coincide in a beautiful way. Uh, before explaining uh, the work, uh, I have been involved since many years, which you know, part, some of you, some of the students know. Uh, uh, I will make a few commentary, and it will be occasion uh, altogether to think on certain questions, and maybe knowing the work before might help 
also to, to think again. Um, th there are a few characteristics of my work, uh, the, the way I see. Uh, uh, I can say three. Uh, one is uh, the longevity. Um, I'm a certain age, and I started very early, very early. And uh, the first building you will see, uh, I designed at 19. And uh, as a boy, I mean, it was uh, a challenge. And, and, and it turned out to be very, very, uh, uh, it was a happy end for, for all the people. Um, this longevity related with the very early beginning, but also a, a life full, uh, a, a rather long in years. And I believe that uh, architecture is a profession one should be optimist and generous. And when one is optimist and generous, one might live longer. And, and a happy life. I mean, uh, an optimist, which means, I mean, it's not a funny life, but it's a happy life. Uh, so uh, this is one characteristic. And there are a few points which continued, few lines in this long, long uh, activity. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I, I imagine where they are coming from. For example, there is one thing, even from the very, very, very early projects, I was uh, concerned with structure, with materials. I, I don't think we can imagine a building and look after look for a structure which goes on and choose the nice materials, depending to the budget, etc. But uh, they make the concept structure, space, light. They are synonyms. Um, architecture is a global look to the problem, and it's a synthesis. And this was a conviction I had from from the. From the very, very beginning, and I am more and more convinced about it, that to explore structures and to, to look, when I said structure, uh, they, they are poetic dimension, of course. They are also um, uh, uh, engineering uh, capacities and things to others, but uh, they, their poetic dimensions are, are extremely important because a building speaks, and it speaks with, the, with, the, with its forms, with its the way it is constructed, the way it is, uh, the, the, the uses of the material. The, the, uh, another thing I, I had as a very, very uh, uh, strong conviction is that the, the uh, urban context or suburban or uh, rural context, uh, human context and architectural uh, order should be unified. If it, this unification is not an easy unification because it looks uh, a very sensitive uh, lecture of the place and the places and the sky and the color and the light and the buildings when one is building. And then in, in the building built, they, they are reunified. Re, uh, and I said it's not an easy uh, uh, solution to, to make a harmony and things like that. It's behind harmony. Sometimes with a very contrasting choices, one can create harmony. You know, so it, it is a very creative process to find unity of the context, landscape, colors, sky, earth, and the building are in, uh, in, in interaction. And this is, I think, the, the title of the close alignment, social, urban, and architectural form comes from that. The, the third conviction I had and, and developed to develop a language of thinking. And, and in that uh, language, in, in, in mise form, in design, the drawing played a, a role uh, very important, whatever the uh, uh, means we use. For example, line is a, is a concept. The, the thickness of line, the, the, uh, the, the forces of line of a place when we make lecture, uh, and, and the way the lines interact between the dots, the points, converging points, dispersing points. This is a, a, a language, visual language, manifests itself with the drawings. That's why I'm very, very, from early age, was involved with the drawings. 
I think there are many, many reasons, of course, a mad painter, mother, but besides that, um, I, I visited so many antiquities, old cities, uh, and I, I had a lot of pleasure, and I drove these cities, archaeological sites. And, and I grew up in the second, uh, at the end of the Second World War, there were not, there were not toys. We had uh, pencils, we had colors, paper, and it was our, our uh, play, play was that. And it helped me very much. And that's when I said, I, 18, when I decided to build a building, I, I, I knew how to draw where it will be built. I knew, I knew how I can express it, and I, I knew how I can make the models. What I want to say is that you will never be architect when you are you have your uh, gra your graduation. A musician is not a musician when he finishes a music school of music. I think one becomes an architect when when he decides to be architect, and it comes very very early. And then once you decide, you should educate yourself. I, I think it's a marvelous chance to have excellent teachers. But one should have a discipline to educate himself. This is, this is such a uh, wonderful and, and uh, uh, dis disciplined for formation. And you are responsible of yourself. And th that responsibility I felt. And it gave a kind of confidence. Um, th this explains the, the, the early work and then the things goes on. And in spite of a complex situation, I, I looked uh, with, with curiosity how these con conflicting things turn out to be an advantage. What it creates. Uh, that's what I want to say. I mean, it, it's a kind of exercise. Uh, uh, one part space fully with all his energy, with all his means. And it's, I mean, one can't be an, uh, a part time architect in that sense, in, in general sense. But, I already talk a lot. <laughs> I show uh, some of the work, which, which you know, as I said. Uh, uh, well, the, the school project. Is, uh, when, uh, when, before you came, I, I, I just look at that. This, uh, 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 as I imagine, you, you, you know, some of uh, you know, it was a school in in southern part of the uh, uh, Anatolia, uh, a village school. These are uh, the, the, the first sketches, uh, conceptual sketches I made. It was in a sloped site, and it's, it was composed of the school. It became, I think, that, that was when I was 19, and we were visiting with friends uh, the southern part of Anatolia. Uh, we, we were very friendly with the people to talk about them, and they said, oh, we need a school because uh, on the hilltop where there are houses, the sun should go down. And when the, in winter with rainy weather and things, it's very, very difficult. Uh, they, uh, we, but, but we have a site very difficult. It's not flat. We don't know how to build. Well, what we can do, we don't know. I said, well, I, I, I know what you can do. I'll make a project and I bring next month. I said, OK. And one month later, I went there with a model. And it was the beginning of the school. But as you can see here, they are in interlocking volumes, uh, cl cl classes. It's a larger class, which could be transformed to uh, a multi-use place, class, class. They are interlocking. And they are interlocking in a way that the structure is that. 